Look at the picture, and I want you to read the story for me. Read it for me. Point to the first word. Go. He is running to her lady. Anything else? The invite him to her party. Thank you. This first grader could not read when school began, but her teacher was certain she would be reading by June. I guarantee it. I feel confident, and I know that my teaching strategies worked in the past, and I feel confident they're going to work presently and in the future. How much is two times two? Zero. These second graders had a lot to learn when the school year began. What is 100 take away 33? 34. How much is 5 times 5? Um. How much is 6 times 5? I don't know those. Their teacher is confident they will know their math before the school year is over they will have the foundation to continue to grow and hopefully they'll all be excited about math and be able to continue to grow. This is Tom Simpson's guarantee. Yes, Tom Simpson's guarantee. Those teachers are willing to guarantee that their students will achieve to a high level. Most of our public schools seem to be willing to settle for an awful lot less. What makes them so confident? The Merrill Report, Early Learning, is made possible by the people of Toyota. And by the Annenberg Foundation, Carnegie Corporation of New York, the Pew Charitable Trusts, the Ford Foundation, and the Annie E. Casey Foundation. Most American parents believe that their children's schools are at least okay, but American students are outperformed by students in nearly every other industrialized nation. It doesn't have to be that way. New research indicates that well-thought-out approaches to early learning make all the difference in children's achievement. We decided to take a look at four new approaches to early learning. Henry Levin's Accelerated Schools, E.D. Hirsch's Core Knowledge Schools, the School Development Program created by James Comer and Robert Slavin's Roots and Wings Program. Green Holly Elementary School in Lexington Park, Maryland adopted Dr. Slavin's Roots and Wings Program in 1993 because their test scores were low and many students were being held back. Roots and Wings tells teachers what to teach and how to teach it. Its curriculum spells out, on a daily basis, the books, lessons, even the classroom layout. Roots and Wings requires regular testing to measure progress and immediate tutoring for any child who falls behind. When school began, we gave Green Holly's second and third graders math problems they hadn't studied yet. What is Regrouping. Uh, I think they forgot. You like put like stuff in groups. Matthew, what is estimating? I don't know. What is a glyph? I don't know. What is ten percent of one hundred dollars? Fifty. What are we going to learn over the course of this year, coming back and coming back? Oh, well, you're going to learn about glyphs when you come back. Uh, you're going to learn about front end and uh, back end estimations, um, regrouping that you call carrying and borrowing. Um, you know, we're going to work with decimals, so it's a, we're look, we look at things in a little different way. Matthew Anker, where is he now? He's uh, below grade level right now. But uh, he has hopefully soon with parental support at home, he'll pick up, catch up. Jennifer. 
Uh, she's had some trouble with the regrouping, but she's coming along, so she'll be okay at the end. Okay at the end. What's two times two? Twenty. What is one hundred? Take away thirty-three. Seventy-three. What's larger, one eighth or one sixteenth? One sixteenth. What's five times five? I don't know. Give me a thumbnail sketch of um, Chris Cloud. He, he's very bright. Uh, I would say the only thing that, that I wish he would work on was be just a little bit more persistent because he's so bright he has a tendency to, uh, he knows it or if he doesn't then he's frustrated. He's like, I don't know this. And he, he has everything upstairs that he needs to do to get through anything. My digits are two, four, and three. Jake Giannini, uh, he's uh, positive as much as you can get about learning. He loves to learn. He was in my reading class last, last year. Uh, has a great attitude towards learning. Uh, if he doesn't know something, he wants to know why he doesn't know it. Is that number more than 400, Mr. Jake? Ms. Barnes, who's been teaching for 14 years, has used Roots and Wings for the past three. She says it's both challenging and enjoyable. It's a lot better than a book. It's innovative to get the kids involved and they're always active. I think the kids learn more when they're really involved in the lesson instead of just learning from a book. Nice job. That was worth five points. Roots and Wings gives teachers a package of books and manuals. Right. Tom Simpson, who's in his second year of teaching, says Roots and Wings is easy to use. I could take the books home, the manuals home, look through it, and it was structured enough that I could go day by day. Then eventually, as I got more familiar with it, I was looking long range, week by week, month by month, and it, it, it just was a good guideline for me. Dr. Robert Slavin is the reformer behind Roots and Wings, which is now being used in 300 schools across the country. I think that the, the philosophy of the school, the tone of the school, must be one in which you're never satisfied uh, until all the kids are succeeding, and frankly, even if you got into a circumstance in which every kid was succeeding, you'd raise the bar. We tested the students again in December. What's estimating? Estimate is when you, like if you have a number, like if you have a number, you have to put like squiggly lines and you gotta look at the middle number and you gotta see if it's up above five or lower than five. If I give you seven quarters, how much money would that be? Mm, $1.25. How much is seven times eight? Ninety. Okay, how much is three times three? Nine. Well, Tom, it's almost Christmas. Um, how are these kids doing? Uh, they're all doing exceptionally well, in my opinion. They uh, are progressing at different rates, of course. Uh, I do have some concerns about a couple, but most of them have surprised me in a way, uh, the way they're picking up on things. Uh, so I I've been pretty happy so far. Two. Uh, two. How many do we have here? Now, you set some goals at the beginning of the year. Here it is just about Christmas. Um, are you willing to, uh, to guarantee that in June they will... They will be where you want them to be? Yes. Yes. Because we had to throw in, we threw in some more things because we had to work on such things as perimeter and area. So we had to throw that in. And even with that, they're still moving right on schedule. We're making a line plot here. Roots and Wings teaches reading and math in quite different ways. In reading, students are grouped by ability, for instance. The advanced reading class will include first, second, and third graders who read at the same level. In math, however, students stay with their class. The strongest third graders help the weakest third graders. 
The way we uh, make up our groups, we have try to have two highly able kids and uh, two lower kids and then middle kids in the group so we can help each other. Now, before you would go outside, you would record all the responses of what a community is like. And Did this take a lot of training to adapt to the slavery? Yes, we're having a workshop this afternoon. So we're always in training, always working. And at the beginning, yes, yeah. it took a lot. It took a lot. Because you have all, you know, old ways, old habits. So you have to break some old habits and have new ways of thinking. You're comfortable with it? Now I am. But not initially but after you get involved in working with it, and I wouldn't go back. To keep a school moving forward, Slavin's program insists on regular workshops for teachers and a full-time supervisor whose job it is to ensure that teachers stay with the program. We're trying to get schools to be thinking about, you don't just come to work, do your best, you know, go home and hope it worked. Uh, you you're thinking about trying to be absolutely sure that you've done absolutely everything that you possibly can to see that every kid's going to succeed from the beginning of their time in school. It's important for me to feel at the end of the year that we've done everything possible that we can do. So next year I can tell the third grade teachers next year, yeah, these, my kids know this stuff. Kind of like a take care of my own kind of thing. I want to take care of all the kids that I can and these kids I want to make sure when they get to third grade are ready. The only way you get to make your circle or your X is that Matt tells you if your answer is correct. In a traditional public school, students who aren't doing well are usually held back, put in remedial classes, or sent to special education. Roots and Wings is designed to make sure that no one is held back. Students are routinely tested, and whoever is falling behind gets immediate help. Matt, is that correct? We have a winner, Jamal. What I do is reinforce what the teachers teach. Um, I do it my best in, from out of the classroom. So what I do is go to the classrooms, pull out the students, and work with them. And I do it a totally different way than what the teachers do. I do, try to do it in a fun way, in a relaxing way where it's to, it will be more fun than work. I don't do much pencil and paper activities unless it's requested by the teacher. Most of mine are hands-on. Board, chalkboard, I mean they love that. And also we do a lot of cards, we do a lot of games. Is there a stigma attached to tutoring? No, they enjoy going out. They enjoy that extra help because when they go out for tutoring it's like fun, it's like games mm -hmm. and they get that one-to-one -one help and they like that. It's no not stigma you're attached. slow, no. you're slow, you got to no. be tutored? And the other kids want to know when can we go, when can we go? So it's no stigma attached. We tested the students again in March. What's estimating? When, like, a number's about a number. I don't think I know what you mean. Like, 310 is about 300. If I give you six quarters, how much money would you have? A dollar, a dollar fifty cents. Dollar fifty. If I gave you seven quarters, how much money would you have? A dollar seventy-five. If you had a dollar seventy-five and I took away three quarters, how much money would you have? A dollar. What's six times five? Thirty-five. What's regrouping? Forgot that one. What's regrouping? If you have like six, take away eight, you have to go to the next number and cross that number out and put, like if it was six, you cross that six out and put a five and then the six on the other side, you put a 16 and you take away 16, take away eight. Okay. We'll return at the end of the school year for one more math test. Mastering basic math is an important part of a child's early education. Learning to read is the crucial step, the foundation for everything that follows. 
it, it's quite poignant out in the hall where the kids talk about what they want. And so many of them wrote, I want to read a book, I want to read a book. Right, that was our, um, on the very first day of school, that was our project. Um, each child got a bear and they had to tell me what they wanted to learn this school year. Um, a lot of them say, oh, I just want to play, I just want to play. But a lot of them say, I want to read, Miss Reeves. Those bears, it's going to be interesting at the end of the year to see if, you know, if they did achieve their goals personally. This first grader did what all children do when they begin to learn to read. She made up a story to fit the pictures. I have a baby her school, Richardson Elementary, sits among housing projects in a poor neighborhood of Washington, D.C. Unemployment is high here, and most families are on public assistance. Urban blight crept into the school. Low attendance, low test scores, and a general feeling of hopelessness were pulling Richardson down. Then, in 1990, the school fought back, but not with a new curriculum. Instead, the school adopted an approach developed by a medical doctor, James Comer. Dr. Comer, who is a psychiatrist, says that before children can learn, you must see to their mental and emotional well-being. So this process is a, a precondition to learning. Absolutely. It's a necessary condition. Right. It doesn't guarantee it. No, it doesn't guarantee it. You still need good instruction. Um, you need uh, good curriculum. Uh, you need uh, children who are um, relating well to their teachers, but the process is what enables the children to relate well to their teachers, to their parents, to the others, which then makes the academic learning all the more likely and important. Now, this school is part of Dr. James Comer's right. program. Right. Well, how does that work? Well, we have like a it's basically getting a lot of, a lot of parental a lot of parent support and we have a lot of community support for us we have agencies come within our school to help us in making sure that our children get the best of everything not only education you know but the we uh social emotional um enhancement we get all of that from outside agencies to come to our school through the coma process to give you an example, um, Thursday night we're supposed to be having a family night here at the school from 5 to 6.30 where the uh, parents and their child, children, come and they go in the auditorium and there's just books. There's just crates of books and they can pick a book and, and go in a corner and read with their parent and you know we're so we're keeping the school open from 5 to 6 30 for the parents to come up here and read our books because a lot of the parents don't have books at home we've opened our arms to them and they see that we are here for them also the room we're sitting in yes some parents this is, take their GED right correct here. this is this is our parent center and we have the, we have this room for them they sometimes just might want to come and sit in this room they feel free sign in Come on down. They, they, they feel they have the freedom now if they want to just come to the classroom at any time. And they know with me they can come in at any time. I want them to come because I want them to see what we are doing here and see how they can support us and their, ch and their children. If anybody have access to any other GED books, bring them in. In the past three years, 30 parents have earned their high school equivalency diplomas at Richardson. Parent involvement is a key component of Comer's program, which is now being used in 600 schools across the country. Comer believes in teamwork. Teachers, the principal, the school staff, and parents are responsible for day-to-day -day operations and long-term planning. Now, by having a team, it means that you have everybody in the school has a stake in what goes on in the school. And that comprehensive school plan gives direction to the school and then other people can participate in carrying out those activities in teams. But the teaming gets everybody involved. Do you think it was valuable for the kids? Yes, very valuable. Comer's program also insists that every school have a trained mental health professional in the building. What do you say to people who say, hey, wait a minute, school's supposed to be reading, writing, and arithmetic. 
spare me all this social work stuff. It's not reality in 1996. That's just not the way it is anymore. It, it's just too many, too many social issues that um, these kids have to deal with. And it, sometimes when these kids come in here, you have to put, you, you almost have to do a debriefing session when they walk in the door and, and to help them avail themselves to be educated. It's, it's, it's almost as if, okay, we're going to put aside the chalk. We're going to put aside the books for 30, 45 minutes, and we're going to talk. It's, it's, it's you and I, you know what I'm saying? And so that they can drop off their baggage at the door. Did teachers have some baggage about whether parents ought to be in the school? And uh, Teachers weren't trained to do this. Teachers come with, I think, preconceived ideas as to the way things should be. Um, a lot of times, there's, their attitude can be, it wasn't like this 20 years ago. Um, I didn't have to deal with it then, I shouldn't have to deal with it now. It's just like, what am I supposed to do with this? I mean, what, I, you know, I don't know where, how I can help the child. So this is a matter of um, helping them to help the kids. What Comer's program does not provide is a curriculum, which means that teachers and schools rely on their own experience and the district's direction. And so Ann Reeves, who's in her second year of teaching, relies on the district's material to teach her students how to read. The district recommends a teaching program known as Whole Language, which favors creative writing, reading, and getting students to talk about spelling and word sounds. For instance, in a Whole Language lesson on dogs, Students would read about dogs, write about dogs, talk about dogs, and perhaps bring a dog into class. Whole language supporters say that makes students more comfortable with learning, rather than getting them bogged down with language rules. The kittens are frolicking happily in the yarn. Frolicking. I love the program. Um, I think it really builds the children's self-esteem. Um, it's great themes. We're doing animals right now and the kids, I can't get them to stop talking about animals. I can't get them to put books away. Is that a dog? Yeah. A yellow dog looking at him. Yes, yes. Johnny Brinson brings 21 years of teaching experience into his classroom. To teach reading, he combines phonics with the district's whole language approach. Phonics is the traditional method, where children learn to read primarily by stringing consonant and vowel sounds together. The idea is that if a child can read the word cat, he can probably figure out pat and bat and mat. Is phonics part of your teaching? Yes, it is. It's, it's a natural part of my curriculum, my curriculum. Phonics has somewhat, um, they, they into more whole language now too bringing everything in. Now phonics is not, phonics still is a part of the reading curriculum, but they don't talk about it that much, but it's definitely a part. At the beginning of the school year, we watch the students read with their teachers. Now read that for me. A little girl is running. Keep going. Least. Very good. Jonathan James. You did. He can read a little. He can, he's still reading. He's still, um, it's, a, it's on the road of being a little bit more successful in reading. You know, we call this the beginning phase as far as he's reading from the pictures. Now, later on, it's not going to be as many pictures there. It's just going to be the words only. So he's not really reading. He's, not, he's reading from the pictures. I still consider that being reading for, for them at their level. But your goal is reading from the words. Your world. goal is reading from, <laughs> right, exactly. That's the goal. But... The goal now is just to get them to read. I see a basset, a umbrella. Mom said, let's go to the first Very nice. Letitia, um, I'm kind of worried about Letitia this year just because she tends to write a lot of things backwards. It's common for first graders to write B's and D's backwards, numbers backwards, but she tends to write a lot of things backwards. So she will be getting extra help from our reading specialist here at Richardson. Um, 
she has a good home, so I'm going to hoping that uh, she'll come a long way this year. But I'm really going to have to work with Letitia. I'm really worried about her. She can't read. No, not at all. We watched the students read again in December. All right. In this box right here, what do you see? I see a little girl running. You see a little girl running? Where is she? Outside. Uh, do you think she's on a farm? In the city? In the farm. All right, she's on a farm. All right. What are they doing? Raping. All right. They what? They rape. Rape. And, and rape. Very good. Bianca's, like I say, she's doing much better. I'm getting her to pay attention to what she's reading now. She wants to look at me while she's reading. She would be more memorizing a lot of things, but I'm trying to get her used to looking at the words instead of looking at me while she's reading. My brown bear was good when I go swimming to, to swimming the, the beach. I take uh -huh. my mother, my father. No baby, my little brother. Special things, things to eat. And there's no and. My, my sun, plus. sun plus glasses is sun. what kind of word is that? Glasses. Yes. Tiffany is just doing wonderful. She is um, an A student, has the nicest work. Um, a wonderful family and we have a thing called dare time where every afternoon the whole school reads for 20 minutes and my children what they do is they can get a book and they can read with a, a partner and she has gotten um, a girlfriend of hers and they have taken the book my brown bear barney I didn't even tell her to and they she's been practicing every day and she loves it and so last Friday afternoon she asked me if she could read it to me after school and sure enough she read that book to me and she was just happy as a lark so yeah. is she really reading or is she memorizing um it's both it's memorization and there's words that she's recognizing so so that's not really decoding then if she's just recognizing she, she is she is decoding some words um you can hear her spelling out words and you know making like for red r r red and she is i think it's all i think she's also identifying words uh, go Simmons Cafeteria. Let's go quickly, Jennifer. Since Richardson Elementary adopted Comer's program, attendance has improved, a 95% rate today, up from 84% six years ago. Test scores have also improved, and so has morale. Let's begin our day with our positive pledge. I am somebody. I am capable and lovable. We check the students' progress again in March. When I go shopping at Safe, my mother, my little brother, my yellow basket, my red um, uh, my red what? Umbrella. Uh huh. And my brown bear one. Sometimes the leaves went onto the tarp. Very good, onto. And two. sometimes the, they did Good turn. Sometimes the leaves went into the basket. And sometimes they did Very good, keep going. Louder. These first graders have been reading from the same book since the year began. When we come back at the end of the school year, we'll ask them to read from a book they've never seen before. Dr. Comer focuses on a school's climate. He leaves the curriculum, what is taught, up to individual schools. The next reform takes the opposite approach, saying children everywhere need a common core of knowledge. All children should study subjects like ancient civilizations, the solar system, and electricity and how it works. Parents have come in and said, um, 
I was thinking about sending my child to a private school. But if you're going to be teaching the same thing that private schools are teaching, I can save money. And we said, yes, you certainly could. We just finished a unit in first grade on electricity, which was brand new to us this year. And it's something I never would have dreamed of to teach to first graders. And I had a parent come in and she told me how excited her son was. And he came home and told her about insulators and conductors. And he used those terms. And another child went home and took his flashlight apart and put it together like we had done in class with just the, the batteries and aluminum foil and the light bulb. They're taking these things home. They're explaining them to the parents. Her school, Kale Elementary in Charlottesville, Virginia, adopted a reform known as core knowledge three years ago. Dr. E.D. Hirsch of the University of Virginia is the founder of core knowledge, which is now being used in 200 elementary schools across the country. Core knowledge means that there's a shared body of knowledge that first graders learn, and there's a shared body of knowledge that second graders learn, and so on. And you don't have to be a PhD to understand that concept. Does Saturn have two big rings around it like that? Well, it has, I think it has seven, um, seven rings, but it looks nope. like two. The reason you do want a certain core of shared knowledge is so that it can be cumulative. E education is cumulative and is cumulative from the standpoint of content. If you mention the Nile River and the kids have an allude to it and the children have never heard of the Nile River because you don't know what they got in the grade before, then naturally some kids will get it and some kids will not. You mean there was a pharaoh that married a, a slave? Yeah. Wait, wait, yeah. yeah. Only the part about a, a slave then a world of push burying a pharaoh that, that part to the rest is fiction. The rest is fiction. Yeah. Court says this is something every child ought to learn in order to be on a level playing field. Oh, and this is the whole premise of it, is that all of these children will now get the same basic type of education year after year. We're, mm -hmm. we're building upon what they learned in previous years. And by the end, there aren't going to be these gaps. There's not going to be one child that's had dinosaurs every single year and another child that's never had it at all. How about for you yourselves? Are you learning? <laughs> well, the, the unit we did on electricity was a new one for me. Uh, Aztecs, Incas, and Mayas we covered, ancient Egypt we've covered, all of these things are things that in my past I've heard about but had to, had to really research. And is everybody here some kind of planet? Yeah. No. 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 What are you? I'm a asteroid. Oh, you're an asteroid. Correct me, but aren't you as teachers supposed so to know this stuff? Learning knowledge is a lifelong process. No one knows everything, and it's a process in which every day you're learning something new. Um, at first, I admit I felt a little guilty about not knowing, and then I said, wait a minute, I'm an educator, and as an educator, we are continuing to learn. I would say that this curriculum is filled with a lot of content knowledge that was missing in our curriculum, and our children need access to this knowledge in order to be on common ground with children all over the country, all over the world. This is Mercury, this is Venus, this is Earth, this is Mars. Jupiter's kind of back in there. Some critics of core knowledge think the material is too advanced for young children. Hirsch disagrees. There's nothing in the core knowledge curriculum for early schooling that millions of children somewhere in the world haven't been uh, studying. So that, that was one of the bases on which we determined what an age-appropriate curriculum was. A fellow first grade teacher in another school sat there and, and went off in quite a huff about how oh, this just wasn't appropriate to teach Egypt to first graders, it was ridiculous, it was nonsense. And I looked at her and said, I've been teaching it to my children for the last two years and they love it. Culture is natural to human beings, the cultural world, and the kids want to join it, and they want to join the adult cultural world. So there's almost an, a natural instinct to, to get acculturated, to do what adults, grown-ups, or, or the big kids are doing. And what solid academic learning does for small kids is turns them on. Let's try this one. Okay. Let's maybe start here. I want to fish in the pond outside. 
I want to put my fishing line in the water. Have you seen this book before? Mm. Harry loved looking at the tops of the trees. He looked in, no, he, he liked the leaves, orange, yellow, brown, and red. No one was safe. No one was safe. But that didn't stop Uncle Willie. He was going sailing, sailing pirates or no pirates. pirates or no Hirsch pirates. is not surprised that first graders at Kale Elementary are reading or that the school's test scores are rising. Our reading scores, without doing anything special, shoot up. And people wonder, well, why? You, there's no connection between what you're doing and the actual tests. So why are your reading test scores going up? And the answer is, of course, both because the kids can read better, uh, because they know more words. And the reason they know more words is they know more things, and there's a connection between knowing things and knowing words. And gee, isn't that interesting? So uh, yes, I mean, I don't know how long this can be kept a secret, John. I mean, that namely a coherent approach to knowledge with knowledge building on knowledge actually makes you better at skills. Very interesting. The fourth program we looked at makes a bold assumption about children. They all can do challenging work. Basically, it treats all students as if they were gifted. These third grade students are dissecting dried owl droppings. Before they're through, they'll have learned a great deal about the environment these owls live in. Is this the head of a rodent? Yeah. So, so you could actually use this to fill out your uh, skeleton, huh? Mm -hmm. Have you found vertebrae? Okay. So, observe your worm, try to figure out. Down the hall, other third graders are studying the behavior of red worms. Before these students are finished, they'll also know a lot about the environment, that of the red worms and their own. Okay, try it again with this worm. See if it goes in the inside or where it's dark or stays where it's light. Many of the students in these two classrooms come from low-income families. Their parents speak little or no English. In most other schools, these students might be labeled at risk, and not much would be expected of them, but not in one of Henry Levin's accelerated schools. OK, la cucaracha, es insecto. We don't look for what's wrong with the kids. We look for what's right with them, because that's the way that you build very effective teaching and learning programs. And you have to build into areas of challenge. We don't ignore those, but you don't start off with the problems. You start off with what you have going for you. Three years ago, Terrell Elementary School in San Jose, California, adopted Henry Levin's Accelerated Schools Project, one of 900 schools across the country to do so. Levin, a professor at Stanford University, began the Accelerated Schools Project in 1986 after visiting struggling schools in San Francisco. When we began, and we went to schools with large numbers of children in so-called at-risk situations, we, we saw a paradox. That is, these kids were coming to schools without the skills that schools thought were important, and yet what they were doing was slowing them down through remediation, through the repair shop mentality. And the tragedy is, once kids enter those repair shops, compensatory education, remedial education, uh, learning, disability, classrooms, and so on, they never get out, which is a peculiar repair shop. Repair shops are supposed to repair, not to further disadvantage kids. And we began to look at gifted and talented classrooms in the same schools. And there we saw a very different spirit of accomplishment, of hope, of possibilities, of results. And we then asked the question, now wait a minute, why is it that you can't give these kids in the remedial situations, those kind of experiences. Why can't they work on projects? Why is their curiosity not built on, but only the curiosity of the gifted and talented kids? Why is it that these kids in the gifted and talented classrooms have more field trips and more science presentations? It doesn't make any sense. What does make sense in an accelerated school is teamwork. We don't have to just ourselves be the, the whole teacher. Um, we can rely on the other teacher to teach those aspects of education, you, uh, teach those other aspects of education that we might be weak in. The students see that. They see that we are working as a team and this helps also with discipline because we get to know them not as the students from room 18 but they are our students also and this is part of the uh, 
if you want to call it, the accelerated schools, you know, vision that we have for our school, that her students are also my students. And when students see that, that we're communicating, yeah. the way that we interact, yeah. the way that we laugh and sometimes cry maybe, the students see that, that we're human and that we're working together and it does make a difference as far as discipline. Yeah. The kids see the, the, the grade levels and the teachers as a team. And I think the parents see that too. And it's a comfort to know that your child is going to have some of the same riches that three people, that they can get from a cadre of three people or four people at a grade level that builds a better program for their children. So our parents also see that. Oh, and I got a skull right here. Right here, Mom. But it's cut in half. There's a ready, you know, group of volunteers out there that when you really have something special that you need help on, there's no problem. I mean, for instance, we're going, we're going to be um, taking a trip to the, the wetlands in Alviso here. It's an environmental ed center. And it's during a time when we can't get buses. It's the last week of school. And we're going to have, parents are going to drive every child in third grade there, which is 106 students. And so it, it takes quite a lot of organization to get them there. But the vans are ready all right. And the, the parents have already volunteered. And, and you know, we're going to get them there. Not always here either. Parental involvement and teacher teamwork are critical parts of an accelerated school. Teachers, staff, and parents make all the important decisions. Levin insists they meet once a week. I mean, the fall will be the time to do that, but we need to be thinking about our focus. We believe that the wisdom of parents and children and school staff and their self-interest in doing the best job makes sense. I've never met a teacher, for example, who went into teaching to fail. I think we've created systems to ensure that many of them fail, and that's a different issue. There's so much talent in the schools. Uh, if you visit our schools and see what looked like a so-called ordinary group of teachers three or four years ago and what they're doing now, which is so extraordinary, you ask, well, where do you get such great teachers? They were always there. That's the tragedy of our system, the lack of use of the talent in the school, including the students and uh, community members to create these wonderful schools. Public schools spend an average of $5,600 per student per year. Each of these programs adds to that cost. The least expensive seems to be Levin's. We're the Walmart of all the national educational reforms. It costs less than 1% of the per student expenditure, typically around $30 to $40 a student. Tell me another category about Australia. Outback. Okay. The startup cost is, is about $16,000. From a, for one elementary school for books in the library, uh, which is less than you pay a teacher's aid and which you do not have to pay for the second year. It's almost Hirsch's approach also requires that a school buy one copy of the teacher's handbook. It costs $12.50. And, and Dr. Comer's school development program is costing Richardson Elementary an additional $70 per student per year. Most of that money goes to pay the social worker and the parents who work in the school as aides. Schools in the Comer program also have to pay a one-time consultation fee of $2,000. Slavin's Roots and Wings program can cost as much as $1,000 extra per student per year, making it the most expensive of the four reforms. However, Slavin believes that his program saves schools money in the long run because fewer students are held back or are put in special education. Special education alone is $3,000 additional per child per year, often indefinitely, until the child drops out, which is the typical pattern. Um, and uh, retention, you know, retention costs another year of per pupil cost. Uh, for a child. And unfortunately some of you are going to sink. sink. Some of you are going to swim. Uh, we return to Green Holly, the school okay. using Slavin's Thank Roots you. and Wings approach, one last time in June. Together. What's 12 divided by 4? What's five times five? Twenty-five. What's um, estimating? Estimating is when you make a possible guess. Nine take away three. 
Six. Nine, take away nine. Zero. This time I'm going to give you an answer. You have to make up a question. All right? Okay. The answer is seven. What's the question? Four and plus three. What's four plus three? Seven. The answer is seven. What's another question? Um, six and one is seven. All right, the answer is 25. Mm -hmm. What's the question? Question. Okay. You have 19 people and six people join in. How much does it equal? The answer is still 25. Give me another question. Um, 25 plus 0. The answer is 8. What could a question be? Eight times one. Now, is that a, a fair test to ask kids conceptually to go from what's four plus four to saying the answer is eight? The answer, what's the and question? you tell me. Yeah. Well, we asked them to tell you know tell more. You tell us how you do things. You tell more. So that was fair. If, if they can do that, is is that something you should be proud of? Yes. Because it's taking it's taking their thinking uh, you know a step further. The answer is 25. What's the question? If I had five cookies and you had five cookies, multiply that together and what do you get? Terrific. You did a great job. I mean, tell me about this year. Have you had an interesting year? Sort of. Have you learned a lot of math? Yeah. Ready for fourth grade? Pretty much. <laughs> We also went back at the end of the school year to Richardson, the elementary school using Comer's school development program, to see Ms. Reeves and Mr. Brinson's students read, this time from a book they'd never seen. All right, I'm ready when you are. Go. Matt, Matt packs cans in, in. That's a picture, and they have a picture, and it's something you dig up dirt with a shovel. Good. The kids dig in the sand at the pool. What do you do? Where are they? P -p Pond. Pond. Very good, Markel. Markel, you are doing an excellent job. Keep going. The frog is in the net. Very good. Net kick the sand. Very good. Very good. The net ran to the map the net tips right tips mat is said the fall is in the pond said mat very good frogs like ants the ants run to the same the frog say rub it. Very good, Tamir. Give me another one. Give me another one. One more. One more. Very good. Anthony, you ready? Okay. Let's read the title. I gotta read the title. What is it? The field trip. Very good. The field trip. They're going on the field trip. Matt. Matt. Pat. Packs, packs, lunch, cans, cans and, and sh 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 shovels, shovels, and, and sacks. sacks. Man, Man. Packs. packs. Now don't cover the word with your finger. Man packs picnic kits. kits. The kids, kids. dig and the sand at, at the pond. Pond. Very good. Yeah, pond. A 
frog is in the pond? Ants. Ants. Wow. On the same match kick. There's that's on the end. Matt kicks the same. Nick kick the same. Nick what? Kicks the same. Thank you. Matt the Matt tips tips and what's his name? What's his name? Matt is. is Madison. Matt. Matt sits on, on the well, it ends with hand, but it's same. Mm -hmm. That's Nick. Nick sits with, with Matt. Matt. Very yeah. good. There's a real difference between the way the kids read. Johnny's kids read better yes, than Ann's kids. How do you explain that? Well, it's two things, mm -hmm. I feel. One, the classroom management. And the second is that with Mr. Brenson, number of years, old school learning, if I may, whereas you have and two years new school learning where there is less phonetics being stressed at this particular time. Dr. Comer and his staff are now working on a curriculum which he hopes will eliminate inconsistencies in teaching methods like those we found at Richardson. The students in all four of these programs seem to be learning, but our television test does not constitute proof that the programs work. Solid scientific evidence does exist, however. In 1990, Dr. Sam Stringfield of Johns Hopkins University began a study for the U.S. Department of Education examining the latest school reforms. He followed students in schools using both Comer's and Slavin's approaches to early learning. We had 20 and 30 percentile gains by children between fall of first grade and spring of third grade. And that's, that's dramatic stuff. That's uh, taking a child who by all rights sh uh, should be I mean, at risk for their entire career and instead they are now reading at the national average and prepared to go on and be successful in school. That's really dramatic. Stringfield's study began too early to include Hirsch's core knowledge approach and Levin's accelerated schools project. However, Stringfield believes all four of these approaches work if done correctly. If you implement it well, um, there are schools, both in my research and in other people's research, that have uh, almost phenomenal academic gains, levels of academic achievement gain that people would mostly say isn't going to happen. But it's happened in several studies done by different researchers, uh, different places around the country. I, I'm one of them. Dr. Lauren Resnick of the University of Pittsburgh also studies schools. She says public schools don't challenge children for a simple reason. We don't believe that all children are capable of doing hard, challenging work. Believe, deep down, most Americans believe that some people are smart and some aren't. And so you can expect some to learn and others not to. Now, I don't believe that some can learn and some can't. I really do believe that everybody can, and I believe it because I've seen it. I've seen the kids who wouldn't think know how to learn well do spectacular things, and I've seen ordinary teachers who didn't think they could do it take the kids to where they can. So I know that our children, like children anywhere in the world, are capable of far more than we're asking them to do. But to ask them to do the hard stuff, to face up to the evidence that they're not doing it yet, means you have to deeply believe they can. I think what you have to say in 1996 is that the children are okay, that the problem is not the kids. Not that the kids don't have problems, but that uh, the children of America, the at-risk children, can learn how to read. And they can read at levels that are the equivalent of the current national average. 
That's a powerful message. You're saying you found out what works. You're saying no more excuses. It's no more excuses. This is, it's, now it's time to teach the children. To learn more about this program, visit us at PBS Online at the internet address on your screen. Presentation of South Carolina ETV and Learning Matters Incorporated. The Merrill Report, Early Learning, was made possible by the people of Toyota. And by the Annenberg Foundation, Carnegie Corporation of New York, the Pew Charitable Trusts, the Ford Foundation, and the Annie E. Casey Foundation. For a free companion guide or to purchase a video cassette of this program, call 1-800-553-7752 or write to the address on your screen. This is PBS.